Well, we are in this series called Exit Strategy, and if you missed last Sunday, what we're talking about in this series is being stuck, because nobody likes the feeling of being stuck, whether you're stuck in the wrong relationship or in the wrong job, or you're trying to move forward, but you're just not able to move forward in any area of life. We hate the feeling of being stuck, and so this is a series about getting unstuck, and I think the best place to look in the Bible when it comes to that topic is to the life of a man named Moses, because from beginning to end, his life is about having an exit strategy to get out of a bad place and into a better place. Now, the reason for that is, uh, as we saw last week, in case you missed, I'll catch you up to speed on the first chapter of his life. Moses was born into a hopeless situation, yet he himself became the glimmer of hope. See, he was born at a time as a Jewish man, as a Hebrew, at a time when his countrymen were being oppressed and enslaved. You see, uh, his people had migrated to Egypt for a season during a famine. A new Egyptian dynasty rose to power, saw these people as a threat, struck first, uh, forced them and pressed them into slave labor, and the people had no options. They were trapped, they were stuck, they were oppressed, and they were crying out to God for help. Well, into this situation, Moses was born, and the reason why he was a glimmer of hope is because he was a Hebrew, he was a Jewish man, he shared their ethnicity, and he identified as a Jew. He wasn't ashamed of that, but that was his primary identity source. Yet at the same time, he was raised in Pharaoh's court as, a, as the son of Pharaoh's own daughter. He was an adopted son. So he got the best education, the finest of Egypt, the, the most influence anyone could have in that generation. All the culture and leadership development that Egypt had at its disposal, it was all given to Moses. So he is totally set up to be the hero, the liberator who saves the day, right up to the point where he screws everything up. That's what Moses did. Instead of waiting for God to call him, he took matters into his own hands. One day, he saw a slave driver ruthlessly beating one of his fellow Hebrews. He lost it. He struck down and killed the slave driver. Then he had to hide the body, so he hid it in the sand and thought nobody saw him. Turns out he was busted. People knew. They knew what he did, where the body was. And at 40 years old, think of this, at 40 years old, with nothing but the shirt on his back, he fled Egypt and ran into the desert of the Sinai Peninsula in order to try to save his own life. So he runs out, he finds a well out in the middle of the desert, he stops and drinks, he meets a, a nice shepherdess out there, a nice girl, uh, they end up falling in love, uh, they have two kids, and he ends up taking on a job for his father-in-law, taking care of his father-in-law's sheep, because again, he has nothing to his name, so think about this, you've got a guy who's 40 years old, who has all kinds of education, I mean, this guy went to an Ivy League school, got the best education, he is cultured, he is refined, he has all kinds of money, and now at the age of 40, he starts his career walking around behind a bunch of sheep that belong to his father-in-law. There's his life. And between last week where we left off and this week where we pick up, it's just a chapter break, we discover that Mo Moses ages from 40 to 80 during this period. All of his potential all of his education, everything that he was set up to be comes to nothing. And his life is on a significant detour. Now, I think a lot of us can relate to that. Because maybe at whatever season of life you're in, before you got to this season of life, you had a vision of what your life might look like at this season. Maybe when you thought about this age, you thought about where you would be in school or where you would be with your career. You thought about what your income would look like, what your financial reality would look like. You thought about what you would drive or where you would live. You thought about your relationships, who you'd be married to, who you'd be dating, who you'd be with, what your kids would be like. For whatever season of life you're at, you probably had something in mind about where you would be right now, but what you found now that you're at this season of life is the feeling that you're just on a detour. And no matter how much energy you put into getting to your preferred destination, it feels like no matter what you do, you just keep getting rerouted. I mean, it's like driving I-94 in the summertime. I just can't get where I'm going. There's construction everywhere. I'm getting rerouted. What do I do? Well, that's where Moses is. And he's there for 40 long years of his life. And today what we discover in the life of Moses 
is that sometimes you have to go on a detour in life in order to meet the real God and to get to where God actually wants you to be, which is going to be way better than where you planned to be. So we're going to pick it up in, in Moses, in Moses chapter 3. In Exodus chapter 3, just making up my own books of the Bible. If you're new to Bible study, yep, there's a book of Moses, trust me. Um, Exodus chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. So his father-in-law was just some pagan guy. And led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. So Moses is out one day chasing the sheep around just like every other day for the last 40 years. And maybe he looks up and he sees something on fire and he probably doesn't think anything of it. It's the desert. It's dry. It's hot. A bush could combust. That happens. But he looks up five minutes later and the same bush is still on fire. And he looks up five minutes later and the same bush is on fire. And he's like, what in the world? See, I've got a paradigm of how fire works, and in my paradigm, fire burns up the fuel, and when the fuel is gone, the fire dies out. This defies my paradigm. This is a strange sight. So I will go over, the text says, literally means I will turn aside. I planned on just following the sheep around and going on with my day. I'm going to turn aside from what I had planned. I'm going to turn aside from what I was doing because I'm going to go investigate this thing which breaks my paradigm of how the world is supposed to look. Now, Moses' life is on a macro detour, but what we see here is in his day, he has to go on a micro detour. And he's about to meet God. In the next verses, for the first time in his 80 years, Moses is going to encounter God, but it didn't happen until he was on a detour. And I believe this spiritual principle is also true for us today. If you get consumed in everyday, ordinary life, and you never turn aside to see things that defy your paradigms of how the world is supposed to work, you're never going to meet God. In the 20th century, the brilliant author C.S. Lewis wrote a book that was called The Screwtape Letters. Uh, the Screwtape Letters is a work of fiction uh, where he has two characters in the book. Uh, one is named Screwtape. Screwtape is a demon, and he's had a very successful career. So he's moved up in the hierarchy of hell. He's up in the bureaucracy now and doesn't spend any more time on the front lines tempting people. But he has a nephew named Wormwood. And he's a junior apprentice demon, and he's pretty much a rookie. So uh, Screwtape writes him a series of letters to help him be better at tempting people. Uh, so as you read the book, it's, it's just, you know, a kind of a creative work into spiritual life. And so when he talks about your patient, he's talking about us, people that he tempts. And when he talks about the enemy, he's talking about Jesus. But there's an excerpt I want to read to you from this book that captures what Moses had to do in order to meet God. The, it says, the trouble about argument, in other words, using reason or using logic, the trouble about argument is that it moves the whole struggle onto the enemy's own ground. He can argue too. By the very act of arguing, you awake the patient's reason, and once it is awake, who can foresee the result? Even if a particular train of thought can be twisted so as to end in our favor, you will find that you have been strengthening in your patient the fatal habit of attending to universal issues and withdrawing his attention from the stream of immediate sense experiences. Your business is to fix his attention on the stream. Teach him to call it real life. And don't let him ask what he means by real. Remember, he is not like you, a pure spirit. Never having been a human, oh, that abominable advantage of the enemies, you don't realize how enslaved they are to the pressure of the ordinary. I once had a patient, a sound atheist, who used to read in the British Museum. One day as he sat reading, I saw a train of thought in his mind beginning to go the wrong way. The enemy, of course, was at his elbow in a moment. Before I knew where I was, I saw my 20 years' work beginning to totter. 
If I had lost my head and begun to attempt a defense by argument, I should have been undone, but I was not such a fool. I struck instantly at the part of the man which I had best under my control and suggested it was just about time to have some lunch. The enemy presumably made a counter-suggestion that this was more important than lunch. At least I think that must have been his line. For when I said, quite, in fact, much too important to tackle at the end of a morning, the patient brightened up considerably, and by the time I had added, much better to come back after lunch and go into it with a fresh mind, he was already halfway to the door. Once he was in the street, the battle was won. I showed him a newsboy shouting the midday paper and a number, 70, a number 73 bus going past. And before he reached the bottom of the steps, I had got into him an unalterable conviction that whatever odd ideas might come into a man's head when he was shut up alone with his books, a healthy dose of real life was enough to show him that that sort of thing just couldn't be true. He is now safe in our Father's house below. Remember, they find it all but impossible to believe in the unfamiliar while the familiar is before their very eyes. In other words, the more focused we are on the everyday events of life, real life, the less we entertain and put our attention on thoughts and realities that defy our paradigms of how life is supposed to work. Moses sees a bush that while it is on fire, it does not burn up. A fire that has within itself everything it needs to continue. We have nothing like this in our universe. So he said, man, I told my wife I'd be home at six with these sheep. She will kill me if I'm late for dinner again. And he could have gone on with his day, but Moses chose to turn aside and look at this strange thing. Now, in our own lives, this also applies to us. Because while you might never see a burning bush, I, for one, have never seen a burning bush that does not burn up. There are burning bush experiences, things that defy our paradigms. Strange things that seem to go against everything we understand about how the world is supposed to work or how God is supposed to work. Here are some examples of what I mean. For you, maybe what you've seen at some point is an inexplicable, an inexplicable person. Maybe you met a Christian and you have a stereotype of how Christians are supposed to act, but this was a person who was open-minded. And that, that, you didn't have a category for that. Or maybe you met a Christian and they are in all kinds of pain. Life is going wrong. Things are going badly. Yet, instead of being a bitter person or an angry person, they're a genuinely happy person. They're content. They're joyful. They have a, a peace that seems to emanate out of them. And you look at their circumstances and you think to yourself, I don't even have a category for this. I don't know how it's possible for a person to have life circumstances as bad as yours, yet to genuinely be satisfied and peaceful and joyful. That, that, that breaks my paradigm. At that point, you have a choice. You can go on with ordinary life or you can turn aside and see this strange thing. For some of you, that's how you ended up in church. Or maybe this one, an unsettling train of thought. This would be like what Screwtape warned Wormwood about. You see, for the modern secularist, if we think through logically the implications of secularism, it will lead to some unsettling conclusions. The modern secularist says, hey, all there is to this life is this life. There's no eternity. There's no heaven. There's no hell. We're all here by a random cosmic accident from the past. We live our lives. All there is is the material, physical world. And then we die, and it's as if we never existed. What that means is love, beauty, goodness, justice, truth, all an illusion. None of those are real. Those are just chemicals in your brain lying to you in order to make sure that we can continue to pass on our genes as a species. Everything in this world is nothing but matter and energy and physics and biology and chemistry. There's no such thing as beauty. There's no such thing as happiness. There's no such thing as love. Just chemicals. 
Yet when you look at our world and, and your heart is broken over injustice, or you feel the love you have for a person or for your child, and there's a longing for eternity deep within your soul, if you begin to think it out, you will realize I have a problem. My paradigm of the world isn't supporting my actual outlook on the world. And when you reach that unsettling train of thought, you have a choice. Like, well, who has time to think about such things and keep going on with your busy life? Or you can turn aside and take a closer look at that. Or maybe for you, it's it's an insurmountable trouble. See, there's a myth that we are encouraged to believe in our country. And the myth that we are encouraged to believe is this. If you try hard, if you do your best, if you study hard, if you work hard, if you invest wisely, if you take relatively good care of your body, life is going to go your way, and you're going to come out on top. We have this view of life that I'm big, and life is little, and I can conquer anything that comes my way, but then what happens, you bump into trouble, and you realize I'm little, and life is big. I'm little, and trouble is big, and it's bigger than what you can handle. And suddenly you realize your whole paradigm of how life is supposed to work is disrupted by the evidence and reality of what's going on around you. Now, there's a Christian version of this too. The Christian version of the same lie goes something like this. Maybe you've heard this before, not picking on anybody. The Christian version of this lie says this, God will never give you more than you can handle. And if that's your paradigm, you are eventually going to get to the place where God has given you more than you can handle, where life has given you more than you can handle, and you suddenly have an insurmountable trouble. Now at that point, you have an option. Do I say, well, who really has time to think about this? I'm sure it must be true. I'll just go on with my ordinary life. Or do you choose, wait a minute, this defies my understanding of God. I'm going to stop and turn aside and see this strange thing. Or maybe another one that you've experienced is an unexpected emptiness. This is the opposite of an insurmountable trouble. An unexpected emptiness because maybe you're the person who, congratulations, you accomplished what you set out to accomplish. You became who you set out to become. You've got the great marriage. You've you've got the great career. You've got the great income. You've got the car you wanted. You've got the house you wanted. You've got the boat you wanted. Congratulations, you achieved it. And in your paradigm, your view of the world, your assumption was, now I'm supposed to be ridiculously happy all the time. I achieved my goals. There's an emptiness. And you did not expect that. At that moment, you have a choice. Life is busy. I can just keep going on with my ordinary life. Or... You can turn aside and see this strange thing. Why do I have emptiness when I have everything I set my heart on? There's all kinds of burning bushes in our world. All kinds of events and circumstances that seem to defy our paradigms. And when that happens to us, it's your choice. Do I want to ignore it because I'm busy? Or do I turn aside and go and see this strange thing? If you just get swept up in ordinary life and don't pay attention to it, you're missing your opportunity to meet God. God is a God who meets us in the detour. The detours of life. And that's where Moses is. He's on the big level detour of 40 years of wasted life, it seems, from his perspective. And then on this micro detour, I'm going to go over and see this strange thing. Here's what happens when he does. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am, which makes me wonder, what else do you say when a burning bush calls your name? I don't know. Here, um, do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So we have the first contradiction. There's a bush that's on fire, but the bush is not burned up. Now we find a second contradiction, and it's a bigger one. The first 
part of this contradiction is that God calls to him Moses, Moses. Now, the Hebrew language is an interesting language, ancient Hebrew, because there weren't a lot of adjectives. So when people wanted to amplify something, they would just use the same noun twice in a row. So maybe there's a pit and it's deep, but what if there's a really, really, really deep pit? They didn't say a really, really, really deep pit. Do you know what they said? A pit pit. So yeah, you have a pit, but, but this is a pit pit. All right? So that's how you amplify things. Or, or let's say you have like 14 karat gold that you might use in jewelry, but then over here you've got pure gold. They didn't say pure gold. Do you know what they said? You have gold and you have gold gold. Right? So pretty simple, right? But when they doubled people's names, what that communicated was a longing, a love, an adoration, an intensity of relationship. For example, when King David's son Absalom was killed, David cried out, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son. He doubled the names because of the intensity of the emotion he felt. Or one time, Jesus was talking to his disciple Peter, and he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has longed to sift you like wheat. Or one time, he's in the home of his dear friends, Mary and Martha, and Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are upset and worried about many things. And here, the bush, God calls out to Moses and says, Moses, Moses, what's he saying? Moses, I love you. I have an intensity of relationship with you with you. I want you to be close to me. I want you to draw nearer to me. Come closer. You have to stay away and back off, buddy. There's a contradiction here. I want you closer. I long for you. Back off. Holy ground. What what does that mean? He says, you're standing on holy ground. Take off your sandals. Now, a place isn't sacred because it's a place. A place is sacred or a place is holy because God showed up. Wherever God shows up, things get holy. What God is saying to Moses is you are in the presence of your maker. You are in the presence of the one who is holy. Now, holy doesn't mean he's really good, and it doesn't mean he's without sin, although it does mean those things. It means more. It means to be in the presence of the one who is holy means the presence of sin and sinfulness and impurity cannot even stand. It is not even tolerated. The holiness ejects it. That's the nature of holiness. And Moses has a problem because Moses is a sinner. This is a man who murdered someone 40 years ago and hid the body in the desert. And he walks up to this bush and God says, Moses, buddy, I love you. I'm so glad you're here. You best back off, son. This is holy ground. And Moses is rightly afraid of a God who is holy. He continues. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Now, this is kind of an aside point, but it's important to make at least in passing. God says, people have been praying. I have been listening. Now I have come down to answer their prayers. And Moses is like, great, I'll just get some popcorn and watch this happen. This will be fun. God says, oh, no, 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 no. Moses, I'm using you to answer their prayers. See, sometimes when trouble strikes, we pray to God for help. Sometimes when trouble strikes, God says, I've heard their prayer and I'm answering it. And you're the answer I'm sending. Moses says, I'm not competent to do that. God says, I know. (laughs) I didn't pick you because you're competent. You've just made a mess of things. You're 80 years old with all this education and all you've done is chase sheep around a desert. I'm not picking you because you're awesome, but I am going with you. And that's where your competence will come from. So, so here's an aside homework. This is just for some of you. If anybody asks you in the next month, will you pray for me? 
Okay? If someone asks that of you, two things. One, don't say, yes, I will, and walk away. Pray right now. Just, okay, yeah, I'll pray for you. Second thing, when you walk away, think about, am I supposed to be God's answer to that prayer? Sometimes God uses other people to answer prayer. Many times God works in natural ways. He continues. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Now, this is a good question, because, okay, so so you want me to go back to Egypt, the place where I made a mess of things, the place I have no respect, and the Pharaoh wants to kill me. You want me to go back to Egypt, and you want me to tell my fellow Israelites, um, God sent me. I'm going to need something a little bit more than that, because if I show up and say, everyone, good news, listen up. I was just out talking to the bush, all right? And the bush says, he heard your prayers, and I just got to say something about this bush. En fuego. Wow. All right, so everybody, let's go. We're going to leave town, okay? I'm going to need a little bit more to go on than that. You got something for me? And God reveals himself to Moses by giving his name. Here's what it says. God said to Moses, I am who you want me to be. Hey, Moses, who do you want me to be? You want, you want a nice God? You want a mean God? Who you? I'm kidding. I made that up. That's not what God said at all. Here's what it actually says here. God said to Moses, I am who I am. You see, so many of us approach God not as if he is fire, but as if he is clay. And we try to shape and mold God to be who we want God to be. If God appeared as clay, then go ahead. Make him whoever you want him to be. But God did not appear as clay. He appeared as fire. And fire shapes whatever it comes into contact with. What that means is many of us have more respect for the weather than we do for God. If you woke up this morning and looked out your window and you said to yourself, but I really want a view of the weather today that is sunny and 75, so I'm going to go ahead and proceed with my outdoor picnic today, we would say, you're an idiot. It's raining outside, and you have to respect the weather. But when we approach God, somehow that's what we do. We try and treat the weather as if it's more real than God is, and we try and treat it how we want Him to be. We try to shape him how we want him to be rather than treating him as the one who is holy and who is sacred and who is creator. See, what we do in our culture is we say, hey, hey, you're a Christian, that's great, that's great. I'm glad that works for you. I need to find the spirituality that works for me. Hey, hey, you've got your views of the divine and of the afterlife. Hey, that's great. I'm so glad that works for you. I'm looking for a view of spirituality that works for me. What we're doing then is we're giving the weather more respect than we give God. And if God is real, we have to at least entertain the fact that he might not be who we expect him to be. He might not be who we want him to be. He is a God who is holy. He is a God who is affectionate. He is both. And there's a contradiction there. At least it seems that way. You know, you know who likes a God who is holy and righteous and has all kinds of rules? Religious people like a God like that. Do you know why? Because they pride themselves on keeping rules and being good. And do you know what they think? Now God is in my debt because I've been such a good person and I've followed all the rules and now he owes me. That's a God made out of clay and they've shaped him to be what they want him to be. Some people like a God who's all affection and all love and all grace and all forgiveness and all kindness. And yeah, he's not, he's not really worried about your sin. He just loves to forgive people and love people. And let's not worry about the holiness. That's a God made out of clay. You're making him and shaping him to be who you want him to be. You cannot become passionate about the worship and love of a God who does not judge sin seriously. It costs him nothing to love you. God said, I am who I am. And until we approach God and let him be who he is, we're not going to meet the real 
God, we're going to meet a lump of clay. So he says, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Now, this Hebrew verb, it's fascinating. When God states his name, he is literally stating the Hebrew verb, which means being. God says, you want to know who I am? Being. Amming. Okay, I, who am I? I am amming. That's who I am. In other words, there never was a time when God, when you can say God was. In the past, God is. In the present, God is. In the future, God is. And he just is from beginning to end. Just as the bush has a fire that burns and has in itself its being and requires and depends on nothing, that's who God is. From before the foundation of the earth, God is. And in the future, when the earth is gone, God is. He is being itself. He is life itself. And God said, that's who is sending you on this mission to get these people un stuck. Now, here's the real question that verse 2 addresses. In verse 2, we're told that the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in the flames of a bush. And here's why I want to end here. We've got the contradiction of the bush that burns even though it's not consumed. We've got the contradiction of a God who is both loving and holy at the same time. But there's still a very big contradiction in this text that we haven't addressed yet. And the question isn't, how does the bush burn without burning up? The real question is this. How can Moses, a sinful man, walk into the presence of a holy God without burning up? How can a sinner enter the presence of that which is holy without burning up? That's the real question question here. That's the real contradiction here. And the answer, according to verse 2, is that the angel of the Lord is in the fire. The angel of the Lord is in the bush. Now, this is a very mysterious figure because throughout this episode, we've seen that the angel of the Lord both speaks for God, yet he speaks as God at the same time. And if you read through the entire Old Testament, this mysterious figure shows up about a dozen times. And whenever he shows up, he speaks for God and he speaks as God. So the question is, as we read this, who's in the bush? Is it the angel of the Lord or is it God? Who's in the bush talking to Moses? And the answer is, yep. The angel of the Lord is a mysterious figure who is at the same time distinct from God and is God. And he's unlike any other angel. There's other angels that pop up on occasion in the Bible, not often. Very famous angels named Gabriel. Every year at the Christmas pageant, someone gets to beat Gabriel and Gabriel shows up. And whenever Gabriel shows up in the Bible, he says, I bring tidings from the Lord, not from me. I'm just the mailman. This is what the Lord says. And sometimes in the Bible, when people see an angel, they're so overcome by the presence of the angel, they fall down to worship, and before their knees can hit the the ground, the angel says, ah, no, 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 don't you dare bow down to me, and don't you dare worship me, I'm a created creature. We are both created beings, and we are only to worship God. Yet, this angel of the Lord shows up in the Old Testament, and there are times when he accepts worship. He receives worship. Worship, he receives sacrifice. He speaks for the Lord and speaks as the Lord. He is distinct from the Lord, yet he is the Lord. Who is he? Now, if you've been coming here for a while, and if you've ever heard me preach on the Old Testament before, you are thinking to yourself, I know what you're going to do next. This is the part where you say, does this remind you of anyone? And this is the part where you say, this points us to someone else who is yet to come. And I'm not going to do that today. Because the angel of the Lord does not point us to someone. The angel of the Lord is the someone. Jesus Christ himself. You see, Jesus was born at Christmas, 
And this is 1,500 years before Christmas ever happened. Yet before Jesus was born, He was still the eternal Son of God. He was still distinct from God, yet God at the same time. He was still active. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, we're told that He was active in creation. And He was there when the foundations of the earth were laid. And before Christmas came, before He took on flesh to bear the sin of man, He was still active. And He still showed up. And here He shows up in the bush. And this is the answer to the question. How can a sinful man enter the presence of God, yet not be burned up? Because the angel of the Lord serves an important purpose in the Old Testament. It is how a holy God accommodates himself to a sinful people. And when Jesus was born at Christmas, that's what he came to do. To make it possible for a holy God to accommodate himself to a sinful people. When Jesus was hanging on the cross for the sins of the world, the scriptures tell us that he was hanging there in your place, bearing your sin, bearing your shame, bearing your wrongdoing. And when he died to pay for your sin in your place, the writers of the biographies of Jesus' life tell us that something profound happened. In the temple, when Jesus died, the the curtain in the temple was torn in half from top to bottom. And the reason why they mention that detail is because in the temple in Jerusalem, there was a room called the most holy place. And it was the place where God's glory dwelt. It was the place where his presence was. And men and women could not go into the most holy place, into the presence of God, or they would be struck dead because they were walking into the presence of holiness. Only one man, the high priest, only on one day a year, the day of atonement, with the sacrifice of blood, could enter the most holy place to offer blood payment for our sin. And if anyone else went on any other day into the holiness of God, they were killed. And when Jesus died for the sins of the world, that curtain which separated sinful man from a holy God was torn in half from top to bottom. Who tore the curtain? God did. Why? Sin was atoned for by the blood of Jesus Christ and the presence and glory and holiness of God poured out into the world. Through the mediator, Through the blood of Jesus, the one who speaks for God and speaks as God, the one who is distinct from God, yet is God. Jesus Christ, the mediator for our sin. In fact, uh, one time during his life, Jesus was arguing with the Pharisees, or they were arguing with him, and they were arguing about his identity. Who are you? Just tell us who you are. Here's what Jesus said in John chapter 8. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, and this was 2,000 years ago when Jesus was saying it, before Abraham was born, I am. I am the God speaking from the bush. I am the one who makes it possible for a sinful man to enter the presence of a holy God. At this, they picked up stones to stone him. Do you know why they picked up stones to stone him? Because they heard loud and clear him claiming to be God himself. But Jesus hid himself slipping away from the temple grounds. If you want to meet and encounter God, it will only happen through the mediator, Jesus Christ, who is the way, who is the truth, who is the life, who is I am. So here's some homework for you guys. Three questions I want you to think about this week based on this text. And by the way, we could spend months on Exodus chapter 3 and not exhaust it. There's so much here. I hope you'll go home and read it on your own. Either open a Bible or just Google Exodus 3. You'll find it. Um, But there's so much going on there. But here's three things for you to go home and think about. Three questions. Number one, do you merely believe in the reality of God or have you met him? Are you someone who says, I believe God exists, I believe he is real, or have you met him? The God who is holy and forgiving. The God who meets us through the mediator, Jesus Christ. Do you just believe he's real? Or is your trust and hope in him? Follow-up question, question two. Will you allow God to be God on his own terms? In other words, Will you treat God at least as if he's as real as the weather? Let him speak for himself. Let him represent himself. No longer trying to make God in our image or make him be a genie in a lamp for us, but to be respectful enough to say, this is a God who is loving, but he is also a God who is holy. 
And I'm going to approach him as if he is fire, not clay. Third question. Will you stop and look? Listen, you're busy people. I don't know any not busy people. I know you're busy people. I know there are so many demands on your time. You're being pulled in a hundred different directions every single day. Will you stop and look? At the things that defy your paradigms about how the world is supposed to work, about how God is supposed to look, will you stop and look? If you're new to Christianity, will you stop and look at Jesus? Is He really the Son of God? Did He really die on a cross? Did He really rise from death on the third day? Will you stop and look when you encounter your burning bush? Think about that this week. We're going to pick it up right there next Sunday. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for this story from the life of Moses. So many times we're frustrated when we seem to be on detours in life, but what we've seen today is that when life sends us on a detour, we might be on spiritual main street, right where you want us to be, right where you intend to meet us. So Father, give us wisdom and vision that sees beyond the immediate and the urgent and the busyness of life and looks heavenward to see you and what you are doing and accomplishing in our lives And more importantly, what Jesus has already done and has already accomplished for us on the cross. Forgiving our sin, taking our place, allowing us to enter your presence because he is the mediator. Father, wherever this lands with us, we want more of you. We want to know you better and trust you better. So give us the wisdom and humility to approach you, the God of grace and the God of truth, the God of love and the God of holiness, as you are. Thank you for letting us do this through the mediator, Jesus. Amen.